Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Lily Dances. I'm the administrative assistant for the Great Smokies Writing Program at UNC Asheville. And welcome to the final session of Writers at Home for the fall 2022 semester. As is tradition, today's reading celebrates uh, our program publication, The Great Smokies Review. And we'll hear some prose pieces and poems from just a handful of the fall issues contributors. Uh, I have just a few announcements before we get started. Uh, the first, as always, is a huge thank you to Malaprops for hosting us. This is our second in-person hybrid event since the start of the pandemic, but it's our first in-person review celebration since the start of the pandemic. We're so thankful to everyone on the Malaprops team who made our live stream review celebrations possible. And we're so grateful for the opportunity for some of us to gather together in person today. So can we get a quick round of applause for the Malaprops team? The second announcement is that registration is open for spring 2023 classes. And some of you have already signed up. Um, we're offering five, 10, five and 10 week classes in fiction, poetry, and creative nonfiction, as well as a 15 week fiction master class with local author Sin Chadwick. Um, for five week classes, we're offering two poetry workshops with Tina Barr. Uh, we'll have an Elizabeth Bishop focused poetry workshop with Bruce Spang, a uh, building blocks of memoir class with Tessa Fontaine, and a social media crafts course for authors with Ali Marshall. And our 10 week classes are a writer's room for novelists with Jackie Castle. Um, that's for brainstorming and outlining your novel. We have a developing and uh, developing characters using the Enneagram with Alan McGee and an advanced memoir and personal essay class with Sebastian Matthews. So you can read all of our course descriptions and register on our website. That's unca.edu slash gswp. So as I'm sure you noticed, today's reading is a double feature and that we're celebrating not only the contributors to the review, but also a longtime faculty member, Vicki Lane. Vicki has recently retired after many years of expert teaching with Great Smokies Writing Program. And so quick show of hands for you in the in-person audience. How many of you have taken a class with Vicki? Okay, yeah, so quite a, quite a few of us. Um, and you may also know her as the author of the Elizabeth Goodweather Appalachian Mystery Novels and her most recent novel, And the Crows Took Their Eyes, a retelling of divided loyalties in the mountain community 150 years ago. So here to read some excerpts from a few of the many student tributes to Vicki that appear in this issue of the review is Stanley Dantoski. Stanley is a former student of Vicki's and is now an Asheville-based book coach and ghostwriter. So Stanley, I will turn the mic over to you. Hi, Vicki. Uh, just wanted to say before I read that uh, there's $9 event parking, and there was a long line just for this event. So this is really, really awesome. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to share my thoughts, and then I'll read uh, other people's thoughts that um, will be published in uh, the Great Smokies Review. So I remember being here at Mellow Props years ago, as Vicki read a hilarious short story that she wrote. And it was then that I knew that I had to take one of her classes. I'm so glad that I did. Her insights were valuable and her class a motley crew of amazing eclectic personalities and talent. I'm a better writer for it. And now I'll share the words of other grateful students. Uh, first is from Tina Frank. I discovered Vicki through her Elizabeth Gold Good Weather series. She was the obvious choice when I took my first Great Smokies class an experience that kickstarted the polishing of this naive and novice writer. That first book was eventually completed with encouragement from Vicki. It hit the market eight years ago. My second story started with high hopes. Not long into another of Vicki's classes, I found myself good and thoroughly stuck on coming up with a plot that didn't keep falling down dead. Vicki suggested adding a subplot. Hmm, I thought, that's interesting. I followed her suggestion. More classes with Vicky, more polishing, and this one is now close to finished. Without Vicky's help, my first book would still be a dust covered draft, and the second would never have seen the light of day. Thank you, Vicky. From April Cope, who was in one of my classes. Vicky has helped me with my writing for many years through Great Smokies. 
from informing me that I use the word auspicious wrong to helping me pare down my overzealous descriptions. She has been a source of inspiration and good judgment for my writing process. From Mary Elric, the right word, the right comma, the right stuff. Details matter and so does Vicky who catches everything with precision and a generous heart. The perfect combo for an editor teacher. What a joy to learn from her. And I hope I'm getting this name right. Uh, from Lena Hendershot. I still remember Vicky's words regarding critique. Play nice. She encouraged all of us at the start by saying, if I can do it, you can do it. I love all of her Elizabeth Goodweather mysteries. She showed us how to use dialogue and how important accurate setting was and how to meld the main plot with a subplot set in a different time. She was generous in sharing her personal experiences in starting out as a writer, finding an editor, and with luck, a publisher. And this name I hope I'm not butchering. From Brenda Delates. Delates, Delates. From Brenda. <laughs> My writing friends and I met in one of Vicky's classes years ago, and we still meet monthly. We owe her a tremendous debt of gratitude for teaching us, inspiring us, and giving us the idea of a writer's group, originally five of us, now consisting of Jane Howard, Mary Alice Ramsey, and me. We have continued to meet, and now, all these years later, Mary Alice and Jane have completed the books they started in those classes. We are very grateful to Vicki for the idea to continue meeting after the semester ended. These connections have developed into friendships that continue to encourage and inspire us. From Sally Lee, also in my class. Vicki, I've taken three courses with you over the years at Great Smokies and we must, I must say that you stand out for me as a model of no fuss, high competence. I've loved your books, the way you run your classrooms, your insights and recommendations, your blogs and photography and mine. Many thanks for all of it, and may you long continue to brighten our lives. From Ali McGee. Vicki, I'm so grateful for your clear, grounded presence and discerning feedback. Your responses to my writing during the 40 pages revision course gave me entry points into my draft that I hadn't considered before and challenged me to clarify and curate plot points. I love the attention you spent with each piece and the way you created an environment of mutual respect for all of us. From Janet Moore, also in my class. <laughs> I'm just gonna do these shout outs. <laughs> I have Vicki to thank for introducing me to one of the most important questions a writer needs to ask. Who is going to read this? Years before George Saunders reminded us of that in his book, A Swim in a Pond in the Rain, Vicki was teaching us to think about our readers and to respect their intelligence. I ask that question every time I sit down to write. From Randall Pride, I stumbled into Vicki's class to get help with dialogue, story, and action as a poet, not a prose writer. What a pleasant surprise to encounter a natural born leader to put me at ease and draw me into writing prose past my quote unquote blocks. Then I discovered her books that effortlessly wove the history of the area into the present. Part of this was her getting to know her neighbors and listening to their stories and use of language. But of course, she always possessed a natural storytelling <laughs> gene herself. I narrowly escaped becoming a prose writer. From Lucy Zhang, before 2020, I had never taken a creative writing course. I always had secret dreams of being a writer, but felt it was either too impractical or not for quote unquote, someone like me. I feared being laughed at or ridiculed. Vicky took my work more seriously than I thought I deserved. Each class she offered amazing critiques and insights. Her eye for the technical craft of writing is invaluable. In fact, two of the stories I worked on in her class have been accepted for publication. Thank you, Vicki, for the childhood dream you helped come true. And finally, from Tommy Hayes, the former and first director of the Great Smokies Writing Program. 
And Vicky, as you and I both know, is an incredible dancer. I noticed that at Wild Acres one time. <laughs> a good 15 years ago, before I'd ever met her, I heard Vicky on WCQS being interviewed about one of her Elizabeth Goodweather mystery novels set in Madison County. Fascinated, I turned up the radio. I was struck by her tone, her intelligence, her good humor, and her forthrightness. I contacted her, and after no more than half an hour, I asked if she'd be interested in teaching for the Great Smokies writing program. The rest is history. Vicki became a mainstay in the program, a beloved and sought after teacher. She had a reputation for not mincing words, for helping writers face what needed to be faced and to recognize and explore the greater possibilities in their work. She paid painstakingly close attention to her students' manuscripts and put countless hours into giving them detailed feedback. I was always hearing from students how much they'd learned with her, and I still do. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, Stanley. You know, I remember when you were in my class, you wrote a thing and you talked about the little uh, metal piece on top of the tractor exhaust going flip, flip, flip. That was exactly what comes to my mind when, when I, they said you were going to read that. I remembered how nice that piece was. Um, it's been, it has been such a joy to teach with Great Smokies. The people I have met, the wonderful stories and parts of novels I've gotten to read. It has been just a real delight to me. It has expanded my horizons vastly. And I appreciate every one of you and every, I appreciate all the nice things you said. And I appreciate all of you as students uh, and invite you to, you know, let me know where you where you are in your, in your quest for publication or wherever you are. I'd love to know. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Stanley. I'm Elizabeth Lutchins. I'm the editor in chief of the Great Smokies Review, um, which is one of the reasons we're here today. And uh, I think there's just one other member of our editorial team who's here, Zoe. Zoe Newton, Miss Stan. Here she is. She is, uh, Zoe is our UNC Asheville intern, and it just amazes me how these people are already old pros at, at editing, writing. It's, it's very heartening. Um, so thanks, Lily. And um, it's just wonderful to be back here. I, I kind of got used to Zoom because you didn't have to, you know, get dressed to come into town. <laughs> and especially on a cold night, but it's just, there's nothing like being here. So thanks again, Malaprox, for hosting us. Um, now I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about our readers. And as Lily said, these are just a few of the people who appear in this, in the, um, in this issue. So please go to thegreatsmokiesreview.org. I see Melissa back there who has a piece wonderful piece um, and read more because they're all really great. They're good because they were the, they were the student, pieces of student writing recommended by their faculty to appear in the publication. All right, so um, first we have the Reverend Margaret Ann Faith, who's a retired Episcopal priest and seminary instructor. She currently serves as the academic dean of the Iona Western North Carolina School for Ministry and the Diocese of Western North Carolina. Um, better known as Sam, her work has appeared in Fiction Southeast, the poetry collection Odes to Ordinary Things, in several sermon anthologies, and most recently in Smoky Mountain Living. In addition to writing poetry and essays, Sam has begun a novel I know a wonderful novel because she started it in my class based on family history. Then we will have Kathleen Calby, a former corporate writer who began publishing her poetry in 2019 in journals such as the San Pedro River Review, Susurus, and Willow Wept Review. 
Her poems have received awards from Cadillac and Pinesong, and she is a 2022 Rash Award Poetry Finalist. Kathleen also received a 2021 Gilbert Chappell, Chapel sorry, mentorship with Jessica Jacobs. Her recent good news is that her chapbook, Flirting with Owls, will be published in 2023 by Kelsey Books. Terry Lee Deal is a journalist, an, sorry, a naturalist. <laughs> maybe a journalist too, a naturalist <laughs> and environmental educator who has taught in both private and public schools in the Asheville area for over 30 years. Terry has a Bachelor of Arts in Teaching Certification from the University of Florida and a Master in Science in Educational Studies and Environmental Education. Did I get that right? It sounds like a lot. Wow, a lot of folded into one from the University of Utah. Her writing passions include creative nonfiction as well as poetry. Margaret Bishop moved to Asheville with a dog named George the day the essay she'll read tonight was submitted for publication. Since retiring from a 30 year critical care nursing career in Daytona Beach, where she and the subject of this essay raised two daughters, she's immersed herself in Jungian dream work, which has led to the discovery of creative parts of herself such as a charcoal animal portrait artist and nonfiction writer, and to the Hayden Institute, where she obtained a certificate in spiritual direction. Eve Mitchell grew up all over the West and landed in Asheville 20 years ago. She's a graduate of UNC Asheville's literature department and has been a writer since her memories began. Her twin loves are poetry and psychology, and she'll begin a graduate program in clinical mental health counseling early this winter. She's currently working on a collection about the ripple effect of American racism and intergenerational trauma through the sometimes unbearable intimacy of familiar, familial relationships. We'll begin with Sam. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm Sam Faith, and I'll be reading an essay about a vacation called Losing Control. Every couple I know has one partner who is designated as the detail manager, the filer of taxes, the dispenser of the dog's monthly flea and heartworm medications, the one who renews the car registrations, finds the mustard in the fridge, and plans the vacations. A few years ago, my beloved and I realized that we hadn't taken a vacation in five years. Who needs a vacation when you start each morning sipping coffee in an overstuffed chair while the sun peeks over the Blue Ridge and the sky leaks light in brilliant pastels? Who needs a vacation when you can walk out of your back gate and hike for miles? in the solitude and unspoiled beauty of the Pisgah National Forest. We certainly didn't need a vacation, but certain in our belief that a change of scenery might be beneficial, we decided to head to Maine via our son's home in Philadelphia. I made detailed plans and gave my husband the agenda. The day after our planning discussion, Paul announced that our vacation was all organized. Airlines booked, rental car arranged, accommodations reserved, even the canoe trip down the Delaware River Gap had been sorted out. I was impressed, curious, and slightly nervous. <laughs> My control issues are both a source of good natured teasing, self-deprecation, and occasional annoyance in the life we share, and I excel when someone wants to find their birth certificate or wonders if we need more gin. <laughs> My confidence and comfort falters when life throws uncertainty into the mix and I have to improvise. Was I really so bossy that Paul felt that he had to get ahead of the planning curve and assert himself? I thanked him for taking care of things and privately warned myself to be appreciative. Pleasant and flexible with any uncertainties that might occur. 
It was a sweltering 100 degrees outside on the early October day we drove to Charlotte Airport. But we were happy to see our son's lanky figure and beer trotted grin awaiting us at, in the arrival area at Philadelphia. Family time canoeing then northbound to coastal Maine. Paul had planned well. My DNA is rooted in the perplexing contrast of natural beauty and man-made squalor that defines the Northern Appalachians. My people lived and died in the mines of Pennsylvania and West Virginia. The mountains and forests are defaced and scarred by the residual damage of the coal industry. Scenic rivers are fed by streams that carry toxins from industrial waste dumps. The zephyrs blow in particulates from the mountains of slag covering everything from porch swings to laundry on the line with a greasy, gritty coating of coal dust. Storefronts on the old main streets are a hodgepodge of vaping emporiums, resale shops with bald, one-armed mannequins, and faded for rent signs. But the mountains and lakes and streams endure and there are pockets of beauty reserved for tourists who can afford ski vacations and summer holidays in cozy lodges with fine dining and modern amenities. I was eager to settle in for a few days of fun with the kids. As I fiddled with the GPS on my phone, I asked Paul the name of our resort. The Pocono Chateau, he answered. I smiled and looked over at him. No, really, what's the name? <laughs> That is the name. He looked puzzled. My jaw dropped along with my stomach. <laughs> Paul looked over and saw my expression. He looked confused. My mind drifted back to copies of Cosmo magazine from the 70s and the resort ads buried in the back pages next to ads for sex toys and sheet lingerie. Full page glossy ads with names like Pocono Chateau. <laughs> I reminded myself of the resolutions to be cheerful and supportive of his plans. What, he asked. I've never perfected the art of the poker face. It got re great reviews and it's not cheap. I'll bet it isn't, I muttered sotto voce as we turned onto the property. As we proceeded down, proceeded down the drive, a long grassy strip of, uh, offered the first glimpse of the delights of the Pocono Chateau a Frisbee golf course. Each target marker exhibited a different romantic icon, a heart, a cupid, a wedding ring, all displayed in peeling, faded balsa wood cutouts. They all seemed to have leaned awkwardly into the passage of time, lending a forlorn uh, air of dashed hopes to the landscape. Paul made a small choking sound. I kept my mouth shut and stared ahead. <laughs> the main lodge was a three-story white stucco building with brownish green water stains etching a trail down the side. A large red heart sculpture hung from the portico over the main entrance. First thing we saw in the lobby was a 10-foot high champagne glass filled with styrofoam packing peanuts. <laughs> I told Paul I was going to find the restaurant while he checked it. I located the ladies' room next to a gift shop specializing in bathrobes, mylar balloons, and contraception. <laughs> None of the bathroom stalls had functioning locks and the soap dispensers had all run dry. I returned to the lobby with a brief detour to check out the display of photography that adorned the walls, photos of dogs dressed in doggy wedding attire, <laughs> Pomeranians and poodles in bridal veils and tiny tuxedos. I reminded myself of my resolution. Paul was waiting for me at the main resolution desk with a look of panic. After 40 years, I can sometimes read his mind. I hear the, heard the silent pleading, please don't yell at me. <laughs> I smiled as the clerk explained our room options. We could have a queen size square bed, but the room was located over the bar. As there were several wedding parties, there that weekend, the live band would be playing late. How late? I asked. They usually stop by two, he answered. He explained that he had a much quieter room in a lodge where Sean and Kristen could be lodged next door, as long as we didn't mind a round bit. 
We chose the cabin with our own bed. We returned to the car, passing a group of drunken groomsmen drinking beer out of a cooler in the bed of a pickup. As we passed, one of them leaned over and vomited in the parking lot. <laughs> I didn't say a word. The cabin was set on the edge of a large pond. The first thing we noticed was the smell of damp and mildew. The carpet was a cheap blend of what seemed to be rayon and astroturf. Maybe the dead cockroach in front of the electric fireplace had set out for a nice stroll and died of disappointment. <laughs> the bed was indeed round and the headboard was made of small panes of mirrored glass. <laughs> round bulbs like a theatrical makeup mirror surrounded the large round mirror that was mounted on the ceiling over the bed. Everything was decorated in a garish show of pink, a blend of the colors of Band-Aid and Pepto-Bismol. The toilet was behind a closed door, but the centerpiece of the room was a jumbo-sized, heart-shaped pink hot tub. The tub was brightly lit and surrounded by mirrors around the sides and on the ceiling. My beloved has seen the changes in my body over 42 years. He's witnessed the slow transformation of pregnancies, weight fluctuations, surgeries, and my fondness for baking. I don't strut around naked like I used to before children, but neither have I grown coy. Still, the idea of taking a bath in the bedroom seemed slightly vulgar. And I was glad that I'd showered before we left our son's house. Paul sat on the bed looking dejected. He explained again about the rave reviews. I kissed the top of his head and said, we're here to have a good time. I promise you, we hear no whining or complaining from me. Then I added, but I reserve the right to tease you about this for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> Just then there was a knock on the door and the kids stepped in trying not to laugh. Sean saw the cockroach and said, your pet's dead. <laughs> <laughs> we went off to find some dinner. The next day was a consolation prize for the CD accommodations. The heat had dissipated overnight and it was the first cool, crisp day of autumn. The sun sparkled on the river and it was, uh, the current offered some help as we paddled 10 miles down the river. The reeds drifted lazily in the current and a variety of aquatic life swam about in the clear water. Dragonflies hovered over the, like iridescent river guides. Aside from a few comments exchanged between our two canoes, there was no need to talk. We paddled, floated, and soaked in the beauty around and beneath us. The bathroom and the bedroom and the astroturf on the floor seemed to be so very far away. We, turned, we returned to our rooms late in the afternoon, and after a day on the river, I needed a bath. While Paul and the kids went looking for the Pocono Chateau gym, I filled the tub and disrobed. I slipped into the tepid water and leaned backwards. There I was in my uncovered, unadorned state, staring back at myself from the ceiling. It was like the disturbing scene in a modern thriller where Granny's naked corpse is depicted floating, bloated and serene in a koi pond. I sat up quickly and found that the configuration of mirrors surrounding a tub <laughs> created the disorienting effect of uh, uh, being surrounded by pale, flabby, naked old women. So many of cascading one behind another toward eternity. It was very close to my idea of hell. <laughs> I bathed and dressed quickly and settled into the one chair in the room where I could not see myself in a mirror. <laughs> there are times in your life when you find yourself out of place, somewhere where you clearly don't belong. The Pocono Chateau was built to cater to young lovers who find mirrors and champagne jacuzzis the height of romance. People whose weaknesses for Dunkin' Donuts and Paps Blue Vermin do not yet show on their bodies. But there are also times in life when you can float down river in the easy companionship of those you love. The days when you see your child grown, successful, and happy, sharing easy laughter with his own wife. Days when the mountains remind you of strength, resilience, and that beauty is sometimes found in the crags and broken places. 
days when the oppressive heat breaks and the freshness of change blows in with a promise. Paul came in from the gym where the broken treadmill and tipping exercise bikes had reduced all of them to uncontrollable laughter. He bent over and plucked the dead co cockroach from the carpet. It's been a really nice day, I said, as he flushed the roach down the toilet. Some things you can control. Hello, I'm Kathleen Kelby, and I want to thank you all for coming and also Malaprops for hosting this event, as well as the Great Smokies writing program and my excellent instructor, Eric Nelson. The first piece, which I'm going to read, uh, is uh, published in the Great Smokies Review, was a class assignment to write a poem about uh, on a photograph. And as you'll hear, the focus is also on someone not in the photo. Navy Boys, Montrose, Pennsylvania, 1942. Uniforms and boxes land on her doorstep, and she must have a photograph. Upstairs, the radio blares a pitch, a strike. She hears the stomp, the cheer. She calls to them. The game snaps off. Steps thunder stair treads. When they leave, silence will drop its covers everywhere. In home front windows, small white tasseled flags appear. Every family's hearts revealed as stars. One blue for each who serves, one gold for each dead. Three shine blue in her window. The street hovers with stars. Constellating her universe of war, these boys, my father, one of them, stare into the Cyclops eye of the future. But they don't know that yet. It's just a camera, their father behind it. She stands in the doorway, arms folded, her boys jockey for seats on the sofa. Nothing can harm them, they believe. Her body shudders. She has led them to that belief. She tries a smile, but her lips are thin. She's seen the newsreels, read the lists in print. An image survives, she knows this, but how to compare the weight of bones, of flesh, to what does not age? No more than paper developed in red light, silvered into black and white. Bodies that cannot long be preserved, given another life. As everything becomes paper. Orders, letters, reports, her boys reduced flat as an unimagined world. Punches and shoves moments before it was snapped. Sailor collars, not quite straight. Tie knots, slack, lace curtains behind. They wanna go back to the radio's ball game or ship out tonight. Three dark haired Irish boys. They have no pictures yet, but they will. As friends' torsos rip, arms detach, trips, ships shroud and smoke, lifeboats capsize, kamikazes dive, shrieking as hornets, the smell as shells explode. They will return, these oh-so-young men, but not like this. Their eyes of the photo now look as if silver dollars placed there shine. Um, to give equal due, uh, this next poem is about my maternal grandmother and a case of mumps I had as a child. Rose jar for a tiger. Inside my grandmother, a tiger paces back and forth, back and forth. I don't know her otherwise. My cousins, my mother, my aunts, we all are in claw swipes, malls to any kindness. So when banished with mumps from my house to hers, I fear more pain or praying silence at best. While the fridge hums its endless song of warning, 
amid the quiet that is no quiet. I sit on the Davenport, pause, ready to run. She spreads oil in her warm hands, surprisingly soft on my swollen neck. As she folds a kerchief under my chin, knots it over my head into twin wings, Reef, relief floods where none has been. Then she rises, pads to a large jar with a Chinese lady carved on it, returns in her flat, careful steps to sit beside me. She opens the lid and a scent clouds all else. Roses, she murmurs, from all my dances, even my wedding bouquet pats the jar lightly with her paw, so it exhales more fragrance. Shadow overtakes its interior, but I can make out hundreds of petals, ruffled skirts, cupped hands, tiny hats, colors faded, shut in the dark so long. Her eyes sift the layers. The flowers must hide something, but her hands never leave the sides of the jar. I lean in to see what it might be. My fawn body, elbow sharp, presses into her plump. Then a rumble courses through her. Enough. I hold my breath. She caps the lid tight, returns the jar, treads away down the long hall. Now I inhale for any scent that lingers, smell the tips of my fingers, although I never reached inside to touch. I look at the jar I have never seen before today and wonder what I have missed seeing, seeing only tiger in this house. Blooms layered and weighted with scent appear at the corner of the house where I, that I own. I steal deep breaths, blend my face into theirs. Such roses cut last only a day or two. Inside, inside, I can't resist. I clip them anyway. Tomorrow, the petals will slip off one by one to leave their hearts exposed. I want no rose jar. I scoop these tiny pink kites from the table, take them outside, throw my hands open, let them sail in the garden. A world away, a tiger sniffs the air. The last poem I'd like to read is the title poem of my chapbook to be published next year. It was the first poem I had published in 40 years, and I'm grateful to Ann Kaler and Kat Clack for printing it. It's called Flirting with Owls. No one would accuse the birds with their raucous melodies, rolling trills and upper scales and sharp note revelries of being a public nuisance, but privately, they are a bit early today, for I have been flirting with owls. Deep in the muffled woods, air sharp as cinnamon, my breath an apparition, hands warmed in gloves, boots snug to socks, dusk feathered in, and I, layered with down, stayed watching long after light left. I could not tell you what I stood to find in such a cast of night, but resting amid branches, my eyes now useless, I turn to listen, present to octaves of silence, which became wonder to one nested, not newly hatched, not fully fledged. Hello everyone, and thank you for coming. I'm Terry Deal. Fair warning. You might travel north, 
ride the wind horse to the far reaches, battle my resistance, and wonder whose frozen footprints linger. Or scramble south, where the womb that held my children lies wilted. You may glide the dark rivulets beneath my skin, scale the rise and slope of my body, scan the dry ravines and scarred terrain. Skip east along the pink shores of childhood. Splash joyfully, a creature of the phosphorescent tide where words are worthless unless you sing them. Swing back and you'll face the craggy western range. There was once a fire. Can you cross the charred remains to discover what's left of that vernal pool, clear and hidden beneath love's mossy years? You must leave your compass behind. There will be no ropes, no clipping in, if you fall, you fall deep into this wild, uncharted territory. Narcissus. Neighbors cry the alarm as rattled as the dark eyed juncos at my feeder. April snow, a killing frost. Beneath pear blossoms falling like translucent tears, I pick every yellow daffodil, jonquil, narcissus in my yard, and fill blue ball jars with sunshine and sky. There are so many varieties of sorrow. How much harder is it to grieve a life poorly lived than a death? In his final years, my father built mirrored altars to himself and lived and died with the only person he ever loved. Drowning. He taught me to love snakes, possums, and the gators who lived under sprawling log bridges that joined the riverbanks. I pulled myself across on hands and knees, watching long tendrils of Spanish moss fade into the dark current beneath. We listened for tree frogs, chased water striders, and tried our best, our best to catch brim or shiners. I stood small and fearless, barefoot in the mud. I was tiny when I swam across the lake. He followed in the John boat, but I swam it alone, fearless in my kindergarten skin. When he threw me off the end of the dock, fully clothed in jeans, socks, and boots, I heard, this is how you learn to be drown proof. I tried to stay afloat. Dressed in a silver scaled fish costume, I fearlessly climbed the 10 foot diving tower, my toes turned in at the edge of the platform. Music played, adults cheered while they watched a skinny girl dive into a gasoline lit pool of fire and swim to the other side. When he took us children camping, he flipped pancakes over a cook stove. We peed in a blue metal pot at the foot of the plywood bed, where together we slept with the man. There, his heavy hands made my terrified body sink in the slithery darkness.
Hi, I'm Margaret Bishop. Can you hear me okay? I'm going to read a nonfiction essay. It's called, Has Anyone Seen My Man? The last time I saw him was on the night of February 17th. He left the house quietly, a little before 11, lying face up on a gurney, still wearing the blue hat I had recently knit and the new sweats I bought because his old ones were swallowing him up. And I feared he was going to trip over them, navigating about the house with his rollator, fixing things, working on projects, just as he had always done, but now smaller ones with a bit more intensity and joy. Upon discovering the small storage area beneath the rollator seat, he said, good, a place for my tools. It was like a kid at Christmas when I brought the two pairs of pants home from Rose's. One sweats for everyday wear, and the other more dressy for his last outing, to watch me play tennis, buy his daughter a sub, and check out the Airbnb in town where his sister and brother-in-law were staying. Worrying, worrying about him out in the cold night air, I was pleased when the two strangers who carted him away covered him tenderly in a homespun quilt. Earlier, awaiting the arrival of the nurse to make it official, I lay atop his still warm body, wailing, taking comfort in the lingering sweet smell of his no longer breathing breath, a smell that had been his for months before the diagnosis. And one of the reasons I knew he would be gone before spring. I'm going to, I hate to interrupt, we're going to adjust your mic. People yeah. are having trouble here. Oh, yeah. Okay. How's that? Oh, yes. All right. Six days after he left me, I brought him home. I snuggled his blue hat onto the top of the economy urn before strapping him into the passenger seat. Does everybody get in the back here this morning? Yes. Okay. Um, into the passenger seat of the silver 2011 RAV4 we bought shortly before his diagnosis. I like riding in this car. I like watching you drive. You look pretty, he said on the ride home from one of his December scans. This time in late February, I noticed that his beloved daffodils were just beginning to bloom. Yellow was one of only two colors his colorblind eyes could see. I didn't ask the mortuary attendant to save his new gray sweatpants with the royal blue piping on the sides or the old, or the old blue Henley long sleeve shirt that he looked so handsome in even when it became two sizes too big, because I wanted him to be warm and protected on the way into the fire. That night I lay awake wondering, just how did he go in? And what did it all look like? I also replayed an argument we had two weeks before his departure. Underneath the surface were worries about not having measured up as a husband and father, and fears of me abandoning him. And now I wonder, who abandoned who? Why do I even ask that question? I carried him into the house, placed him on top of the cold wood stove, and placed two of the black steel Lionel cars he had tinkered and played with recently, polishing the small brass plates he had fixed to them over four years ago, but upon the engine car plate he had etched in bold black lettering, number 8956, my birthday, and on the passenger car, CNM Railroad, CNM being our initials. Top his blue hat, I placed a small candle. After he entered hospice care, my man said, I'd like to set up the train if that's okay with you, since I can't go into the attic, though I know he snuck up on more than one occasion. I found some track online. If you're okay with this, will you order it for me? Five days later, I returned from an errand to find him lying on his side on the living room floor, watching the train go round and round underneath his hospice bed on a track lit up with multicolored flashing lights. Other times I would catch him lying there, eyes half closed, lulled by the rhythmic click-clack sound of cars gliding over track into a half awake, half asleep state of deep contentment. Or maybe it was the oxycodone. Two days before his departure, we sat side by side on the edge of his hospital bed in the middle of our living room, leaning into each other. In the photo one of our daughters took, his blue eyes looked perhaps more beautiful closed the inner light visible through soft, puffy half-moon lids. Ahead of a smile as I show him a video of our niece playing old Lang Syne on an old violin he sent her the week before. His right arm encircles my waist with a tenderness that had always been his, but I hadn't been able to really, truly receive until then. Perhaps only a heart that's breaking open can let this much love in. 
On Saturday afternoon, one month after he left, the day before his Zoom service, I transferred his ashes into the ceramic urn he designed. I sifted through hard, gritty bits of white fragments with my fingers, wondering which might be bones and which teeth, and dabbed some of him on my wrists as if he were a perfume. When I finished, I placed his hat back on, being careful not to cover his ceramic nameplate, underneath which is C plus M equals M plus C and other mathematical and musical notations. That night, I lay away thinking that the way his inner light had shown ever brighter as his outer self grew smaller was like the cremation had started from within. On Monday morning, a friend asked if I felt his presence here with me at the house, and I struggled to answer. I missed the warmth of his body and his scent, even the one that became his only because of the disease. I cling to that and huff the fruity scented chapstick that I applied to his lips in his final days. Photos too, especially the later ones in which I can see the light growing ever more visible through forever closed eyes. And in his beatific smile when our daughter cradles his blue hatted head. I wonder, is this presence or what is left when the presence is gone? I don't feel him in the ashes, but I do in the light that awakens me each morning in the peacefulness that contains me when I slow down enough to let it in, and in my floppy heart that's trying to figure out how to beat in a new rhythm. On Monday afternoon, his best friend, George, and I returned from our walk and entered the garage. I didn't want a dog when we retired, but he won. I used to joke that when we retired, I worked hard reading, writing, and doing dream work to get in touch with my soul. All he did was go out and get the dog, named him George, and took him for long walks. <laughs> Now I can't imagine my life without George reminding me to keep my nose to the ground, not the grindstone. My oh-so-tender lover man was also a builder, a fixer, an inventor, a tinkerer, a plumber, a mechanic, a musician, an electrician, an astronomer, an audiophile, and a collector, and I'm overwhelmed by the amount of stuff he left behind. A jigsaw, a bandsaw, a table saw, routers, planers, 20 plus drills, and all their associated bits, hand tools, power tools, half empty 15 year old cans of paint, drawers and drawers filled with stuff, tube amplifiers, turntables, speakers, telescope parts, an old stand mixer that he converted into a meat grinder, <laughs> antique toasters, a whole shelf filled with plugless frayed extension cords, and other shelves overflowing onto the floor with stuff, most of which I have no effing clue what it even is. <laughs> The oil stained concrete floor is littered with sawdust and rags and tarps and pieces of cardboard and bits of paper and plastic milk jugs filled with dark brown oily looking substances and threadbare dog toys and wood shims and firewood bark and autumn leaves. How could he do this to me? Leave me all his fucking shit to clean up. What I can't sell and I have no idea what any of this crap is worth. I'll have to haul off to the dump all by myself and I don't even have a truck anymore. And now I have this heart rhythm problem. And he left me all alone here on this mountaintop in this podunk town. When I pause to catch my breath, something shifts. And when I look at the garage floor again, it looks like a playroom. And the tools look like toys. An afternoon spent wailing brings with it the realization that I'll have to get rid of some of my stuff before I can face his garage. As far as his stuff goes, I think I'll keep one drill, one antique toaster, one turntable, one amplifier, a small sampler of his vinyl record collection, two kerosene lamps, two train cars, a blue hat, a dog named George, and the memory of the moment our marriage was consummated, sitting on the edge of his hospice bed with the CNM railroad car circling the track beneath us. Can everyone hear me? Sound good? Okay. Okay, everyone, I'm Eve Mitchell. Thank you so much for coming tonight.
this is unreality in which you get to be a black father. I'm priestly protecting you in my orb of light down every aisle. My tiny hand wants your huge one this once. Let me adore you. Bless this reverie, you'd stop me from playing with the scoop and the beans. Knocked me flush, unnoticeable, alive. Now I'll kneel in conveniencing to tie your bootlaces come undone. They're caked with earth from our perfect hotbed. I wish I could show off. You're kneeling at dust once, watching with sensitivity the beds settle. People want to know you for the first time in history. I imagine a break, a soft turning, the collective resplendent, repentant. We test the cherries for sweetness. This is inheritance. I wake to the kind of doom that wants a decision. Find earth to tether my string of dying lights. Our ghosts instruct from narrow seats to move just an inch at a time to go back if need be. Whose body was thrown into a ditch? Your last wishes trauma speak. Someone must have warned it so often that you took it up as yours. I stay warm, I listen, I wait. So much of my days are spent in these pursuits. I think I've wasted my life. Other days, I can't see what could be more important. An opening small but ever widening is a trusted other who will say, no one's going to harm you here. And that reverberates 200 years or more settling my blood. It isn't in me anymore to erase every trace of myself before I can be noticed. What will happen to me? This is National Geographic. You're high up in bed with your dinner trying not to cling too much with your knife and fork, shoulders raised like shorn off wings. Look at those boys, you'd say, and turn to find me on the cold wood floor to absorb the shock of sunlight, football satisfying as drums, as heartbeats. I wanted to tell of your roaming heart, your nature body I believed in most holier than father. You knew the name of every tree, every flower, whittled your knowledge down to survival when that beauty was yours as much as anyone else's, more. The screen made you an apparition of a boy, your bare back a history too awful alongside birdsong. I wanted to get you home to a place I couldn't fathom with the desperation of a mother, like the last person with hope that you might live. This is elegy number one. When I picture you in a therapist's office, your head is in your hands like the sad old man and Van Gogh's painting. The light is turning blue. You're in your work pants and steel-toed boots. I've heard your whole head is gray. Has anyone ever asked you, he says, how you feel? Who knows you best? How do you make it to sleep? Walt, Walt. Walt, what is it we can do for you now?
Again, thank you all for being here. This is just wonderful to see this room. I Zoom was kind of fun, but it was nothing like this. So it's just <laughs> great. And I hope you'll all come back when Writers at Home resumes. I'm not doing this in the mic, but you can hear. When Writers resume, Writers at Home resumes in January. So um, also don't forget to check out those spring classes. They're all great. Thank you.